Well, today's topic is one that we probably all know if you're thinking toward recession, things like that, there are th steps that you should take to prepare. Many of us probably don't because it can feel like it's a long way off and then we can feel burned when things hit. So we're hoping to have some very actionable things um, to take out today and understand how we would prepare for that. Um, I'm going to facilitate today's session and also help present some of it. Um, I'm a virtual CFO with Summit CPA Group, so I have clients. This topic is very much on our minds as we work with clients and give them guidance around things like this. So I, I love that we're talking about this today. I have a couple of administrative things, and then we'll get into the content of what we're doing. So this is a CPE event. We have one credit that people will get. We do need people to attend the entire 50 minutes. We've already gotten a question about polling questions, so we will have three polling questions that will pop up. People need to answer all three of those. If you do so, you will get the CPE certificate emailed to you within the next week or so. Um, you can't interact with us uh, via voice today, but you can ask questions. And both Jamie and I are really going to be focusing on that and integrate as many of those questions into the conversation as we can. So please ask and ask and ask the kind of questions you have. You will get a copy of the replay and slides. Um, so I'll just tell you from the top, the most common questions that we get from people is, Will we get the CPE certificate and when? And can I get a copy of these slides? So try and preempt some of those. Yes, you will get those. They will be emailed out. We promise that that will happen. Okay, so I mentioned that I work for Summit CPA Group. So let me tell you just a little bit about our company. Um, we started about 20 years ago in 2022. Since 2004, sorry, in 20, 2002. Since 2004, we've been providing CFO and back office services to clients. In 2013, we went fully distributed. All of our team members work remotely. And then as of last year and at present, Summit CPA has joined Andrews CPA and Advisors. So we are now a division of Andrews CPA and Advisors. Okay, you see two other people here with me today that I have not let talk at all so far. Let me tell you who our speakers are. Um, Tom Barrett is a certified scaling up coach. He works with Pinnacle Business Guide, and he's also co-founder of Navigate the Journey. Tom, welcome to our presentation today. Thank you, Tom. Great to be here. And then also Jamie Naw, and Jamie is our director of VCFO services. Um, and also he works with Summit CPA Group, a division of Anders CPA and Advisors. So Jamie, welcome. Thanks, Tom. I'm excited to be here with the Toms today. Should be fun. Good. Yes, you're sandwiched in between the <laughs> two of us. Okay, so let's go through what our objectives are today. One is help you to begin preparing now for the next downturn, and especially in terms of clients, but also if you have your own business. How would you prepare for that? Learn how other people are preparing and then also leave with an action plan. So those are our three objectives that we have today. The way we're gonna to try to get through those with our agenda are a couple of different things. Just what's the value of preparing? What is that business case for preparing? What are the top 10 strategies to prepare for a downturn? And I really like the mix of this that Tom is a scaling up. Business coach will give us the guidance from that perspective. As you know, we're a VCFO firm and we're going to give you the perspective, um, I think very consistent with what Tom's saying, but maybe a little bit more of a financial focus into that. And then we'll get to a conclusion after that. Okay. So the value of preparing. Tom, do you mind starting us off and yeah, helping us yeah. with the business case here? So uh, yeah, I think as we all know, downturns are inevitable. It's kind of uh, maybe the last few years, maybe we don't think they are, but right, we, we just know that they are. So um, one of the great things about right the past and history is that we can learn from the past. Uh, so um, you know, a lot of what today is right, how, how can we learn uh, from how companies uh, survive, not only survived past downturns, but also thrived through downturns. So we're gonna look at some research uh, some quick research that we found uh, that I think is really helpful. So this comes from um, Harvard Business Review, uh, McKinsey, uh, and also um, um, McBain. Um, they are Bain, yeah. So they yeah, let's advance the slide there. So so basically, this first slide is is telling us uh, basically uh, for um, when they looked at the last downturn, right, kind of the 07, 09 period, they started to notice that resilient companies started to pull away from non-resilient companies, but actually that gap uh, in shareholder return actually uh, got even bigger in the years ahead. So I think in some ways, what this shows us is that the benefits of preparing for a downturn are not just, again, for the downturn, but actually to kind of make the business better. So in the long run, uh, you're going to achieve even uh, better results. Uh, the next slide is is sort of similar um but it it, it kind of shows that um 
over probably a slightly longer period of time, uh, in this case, what the Harvard Business Review found is the difference between uh, what they call prepared companies versus unprepared companies. So prepared companies, again, not only did well during that 07, 09 period, but even more so uh, in the years after. So again, that's one of our big objectives here with the, the webinar today is to help uh, all of you uh, do the same thing. Uh, and I think then, yeah. so the big question is, right, um, how, how to thrive through a downturn? The number one answer, right, is just preparation. Uh, and, and that's what we're um, about here today. So that, um, these graphs are stunning, Tommy, that high growth during a growth period, I'm looking at that dark gray double dip reception, right? The companies would be thrilled to have that kind of growth in a economic boom. The fact that they could do it during a recession is really impressive. Yeah. Yeah. But again, I think it just shows that, you know, really well led and uh, run companies, again, do well mm -hmm. in downturns, but also do well when, when you know, the sun is shining and the wind is at our sure. back. And so it kind of it applies to both, which is in some ways surprising, but maybe not surprising if you think about it more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'll just remind people we have the polling question, first polling question out. So if you have an answer, please do. So I'm going to close out here in about 30 seconds. And I'll, I'll just speak from our client's experience too. I know we're gonna we're gonna go through this a little bit, but I, I think that what we've seen is is clients that are prepared are able to react quicker, and that's what it comes down to is mm -hmm. is that you know when when something happens to you and you're making a decision without any information, you're not most likely going to make a good decision. So when you're making that decision with a lot of information and you've been prepared for it, you're going to make a good decision. And so that's what a lot of it comes down to is being prepared allows you to make better decisions. And so I know we're going to talk through that in this ten, but that's what I want to see tell you from what we see from our clients is that. When they've already been through the scenarios and like, oh, okay, we know what's going to happen here. We can um, make a lot better decisions. And that's, it's, it's a really great conversation to have. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Yep. So I think we're ready to move on to the, the, the next slide, Tom. Okay. So, so yeah, so um, you're, you're going to get a file to, tomorrow that's going to have um, things like a SWOT analysis on there. But even for this call, it might be good for you if you've got your journal, <clears throat> excuse me, write down strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So as you hear ideas, you can start to put them uh, in one of those four buckets. So that might be a good way to make today even more uh, thought-provoking for you and also to give you some tangible next steps as well. Um, yeah, and you can keep going, Tom. Okay. So yeah, so now we're gonna get into sort of our, our tangible nuggets. So we're calling these the top 10 strategies to prepare for a downturn. And so this is really from our experience, um, Summit mm -hmm. and Navigate the Journey. So uh, let's go to number one. Uh, so we're calling this, it starts at the top, just like with everything else, uh, preparing for a downturn definitely starts at the top. So I think first, uh, so whether or not you're the owner or the CEO or a key leader uh, in your business, just uh, want to make sure that you've got a healthy and aligned leadership team that can get in a room and have really just hard, open and honest conversations um, you know, about whatever you need to have. And then you can just leave aligned. So that's, that's really one critical thing. Uh, second is scenario planning, right? So now is the time to get also get in a room and go, okay, what happens if revenue drops 30 percent what would we do if it drops 40 percent what would we do and so jamie what what kind of advice are you giving your clients as it comes to scenario planning yeah this this was definitely key to us uh during the whole the ppp loan time and all of the pandemic was what we did with a lot of our clients is we sat down with them and we drew out a a best case scenario a worst case scenario and then kind of a middle scenario and and we talked about those decisions before any of those scenarios became real. And so when you have those three situations and you say, okay, best case scenario, awesome. We're going to be fine. Nothing's going to change. Worst case scenario, we're going to have to lay off five people. They're probably going to be um, in this, in this section or in this area. Um, and so we were ready to do that. And then middle case, in case it falls in the middle there, this is what we're going to do, which is maybe we'll just lay off one person, or maybe we won't lay off people and we'll have to cut these expenses. But the fact that you have those conversations before you're even into that scenario allows you to make quick decisions and it takes the stress off of it was what we saw with our business owners is they you know we, we feel like 
once A, B, or C happens, we know we're going to fall into one of those three scenarios. And then when you're ready to already make that decision, the stress is out of those decisions because you've already thought through it. And you've already dealt with the stress. And so it makes it a lot easier to just say, okay, this is the plan. This is how we're doing it. And we know that if we cut these mm -hmm. three people, we're still going to have a healthy profit and build cash and, and be able to survive this downturn. And so that that's to us was a huge thing during the um, pandemic, but also at any time, anytime you feel like there's a situation that's upcoming, it's being prepared for and being allowed to step into those scenarios as they come true yeah and kind of the related thing to that right is what your leadership team right actually discuss you know whatever sacrifices might need to be made right so if there is cutting uh you know discuss that again ahead of time with your leadership team you know in the 07 08 uh recession you know i know some businesses that basically went to a four-day work week for maybe a little over a year mm -hmm. um so again just just think through those uh scenarios ahead of time all right we can go to the next one tom okay so the next strategy we're calling understand who your A players are. So first of all, um, just having just a, a culture where our expectations are crystal clear, everybody's getting continual feedback and coaching. I think that's, again, no matter good times or bad times, that's always good. But I think particularly here going into a potential downturn, uh, I think it's really important to understand the difference between kind of like just like generically right people and especially the past, you know, two years uh, with hiring being so difficult, sort of getting any warm body on the bus uh, has been great. But I think uh, what we would encourage you to do is think about, okay, who are your A players? So if it was a, a basketball team, think about who are your starters that you want to put out on the floor and are really key right now. So I think make sure that you can distinguish, again, kind of almost like rank rank your entire team. Um, and then the kind of the related thing is, well, have a retention strategy for your your A players. Make sure that whatever happens, that you can at least keep the A players. I think of that being really important, like when Jamie talked about the scenarios, right? If you have one where maybe staff is being reduced, yeah, you most likely want to make sure those A players stay on board. So whether it's communication, compensation, leadership, whatever opportunities you have, that those people stay and you don't have the wrong people decide to leave. And I think the other thing that's important here is I've been through many, many conversations with teams about doing cuts, and it's always a hard conversation at first. And it's a lot of times it's a hard conceptual conversation because you're dealing with people, you're dealing with people's lives and you're thinking, okay, what, what would happen if I were to lose this job? How would I feel? But then oftentimes when you get into the meat of the conversation, it's pretty easy to identify the three people that either are just in the wrong place, right? This is not the right position for them. They're a great person, but they, they need to find something that's a better fit for them, or they're just not performing well, and they know they're not performing well, and they're, they're bringing the team down. So oftentimes when you get to the cuts, the first three or four or five people are already pretty easy because you know who they are. And then I think the other part of it that talks about here is right person. Um, you know, we talk about all the time, the right person in the right position. And I know Tom, Tom mentioned that, but oftentimes you'll have a person that's in either a management or leadership position that's just not doing well and so if you're going to get rid of that person you have to think about who's going to step into that role and who's who has the right skills for that person if you have to go out and hire that person then that makes it a little more difficult where you're like okay we actually have this manager who could easily hop into a director role if we were to let go of this director and they would do a great job in it so make sure you're thinking one step ahead and not just saying okay we're going to move the move along from these four people and just be done with it there's there's those jobs do need to be filled and we need to find ways to who's going to take those responsibilities yeah yeah Okay, are we ready to go on to yes, yes. talk about culture? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, next one, uh, next nugget for uh, preparing for a downturn, we're calling it obsess about a culture of performance. Again, works for uh, when times are good or times are bad. So first thing, uh, you know, continue to focus on your core business. If there's a downturn coming, or if we think there is, probably not a, a time to start risking time and money with non-core uh, activities. So I would say hone in uh, on your on your core business. Um, next is, you know, ensure your leaders and teams are just you know, continually developing, right? Uh, do they have the ability to work in the business, right? The day-to-day -day operations uh, on a continual basis do that really well, but also work on any sort of on the business, uh, you know, uh, additional initiatives or priorities that are needed to either take advantage of opportunities or if times get bad to execute some of those scenario plans that we talked about. Uh, and then the last thing uh, here about uh, having a culture of performance is really uh, create a culture of winning. Uh, so, you know, going back to kids, I think we all uh, love the whole idea, right? Whatever game we're playing, right? We want we want to win. We want to be on a winning team. 
So with things like KPIs and scorecards, right? Have we created an environment where we've painted the win on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, you know, for our team? So uh, I know Summit knows some things about that. So uh, how do you guys help your clients with that? Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing is, is exactly what you said is, you know, 4DX talks about kids as well when you read that book and they talk about, you know, if you're playing a sport and you just, if you go to a recess and watch kids that are just kind of goofing around playing kickball and then you go to a game where there's a scoreboard front and center, there's just a different level of intention, a different mm -hmm. level of pressure when you're at those two, two types of events. And so your team needs to know what the score is and they need to know if, um, if they're winning or not. And so I think that's the biggest thing is, is having that scorecard so people can see it and find it and know whether they're winning or not. And so I think that's the biggest thing. And that's what we do. We, we meet with our clients every month and tell them these are the KPIs that show you're winning and are we doing it or not? And if we're not, how can we get there? How can we win? What are the steps we need to do? And so that's, that's the biggest thing is actually keeping score. Yep. And I think in a time where, so people could be saying, okay, you're three steps through 10 and this just feels like a, how to run a business. Well, this doesn't sound <laughs> like a downturn. And I would say on one case, I think that's true, but at the same time, things like Jamie, your point, this winning culture and scorecard, when things start changing really quickly during a downturn, if they do, this becomes really important. And I think Tom's initial point about folks on the core business, a downturn might be a time to say, well, maybe we don't want to take the risk of doing something in a non-core business with a downturn. We've looked at the scenarios and that could be difficult. Maybe in a growth phase, you might do those kind of things. So I could see that's some differences. In that. That's a great point, Tom. I think the companies that keep score a lot of times are two months, three months ahead of the news when it comes to a recession. Like, you know, I've mm -hmm. talked to so many of my clients and they're like, Oh, the news is finally catching on that. We, we knew for the last three months that we haven't been winning. And so we've, we've reacted to this. We're ahead of the game because we've been keeping score for the last three months and we're doing the same stuff. We're still, we're still talking to the same number of leads. We're just closing less deals and companies are spending less. And so you're, you're just a little bit ahead of it because you are keeping score. Right. Yeah. Great point. Yeah, uh, I think we can move to the next uh, strategy. So, so Tommy, yeah, you're right. There's uh, many of these right strategies, and all of them really again work in the when times are great or times are bad. But it reminds me of yeah. uh, Vince Lombardi, I think, right at the beginning, um, at least of one very memorable season when he brought his team, when he brought his, the Green Bay Packers together. He started off training camp with uh, "This is a football," uh, right? That so he brought uh -huh. them all back to the basics. And so again, when we you know, when we reflect on all this, I think, yes, uh, these fundamental business uh, basics and fundamentals, again, just work uh, in all kinds of uh, environments. So, yeah, so next mm -hmm. one is uh, optimize processes. So um, just right. First point is basically make sure that if key people walk out the door, that your understanding of how to do the the key aspects and processes of the business also don't walk out with them and you're kind of scrambling uh, trying to figure it out uh, so obviously get everything down from you know that, that's in people's heads uh, all their experience of the the right and best way for your business mm -hmm. to do it right get that documented get that accessible uh, another key thing is just cross train so um, you know, eliminate those single points of failure as it comes to key processes that it's not all dependent on one person, that that person's out sick or they leave whatever or on vacation, that that somebody else can do that those particular uh, processes. And then through all this too, just leverage, techn leverage technology, right? And automation with the, you know, uh, technology and automation becoming cheaper, more prevalent, more tools, uh, so, so reimagine again, how you can make your business more efficient and effective uh, through your processes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think the biggest thing on technology is implementing technology while it is a cost saver up front, it's not a cost saver. And so like trying to do that during a recession is going to be really hard because we all know we've all tried to implement new technology or inter introduce bots or outsourcing. And it's, 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 right. you think it's going to be easy because it's going to be cheaper, but it takes a lot of resources to get that done. And if you're in a recession, you're like, oh, okay, now's the time we've been waiting. Now's the time to start using bots. You're going to be sorry because you're not going to have the resources to implement those bots. And so try to get that stuff introduced ahead of time. So that way, when the time does come, it's a little bit easier to um, to cut to have those true true cost savings because it takes six to twelve months to truly get there. Mm -hmm. Yep, great, yeah, it's an excellent point. Yeah, so uh, um, strategy number five to prepare for a downturn we're calling communicate openly and transparently. So uh, you know, there's a saying that nobody talks to you more than you talk to you. 
Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that's true in uh, all kinds of circumstances. And so especially if, if things do turn down, right, there's going to be more chatter, right? First of all, in people's own minds, right? They're going to be talking to themselves, oh, you know, are we going to get laid off? You know, what's happening here? So again, uh, you need to have this, this um, environment where there is open and honest uh, communication. So I'd say first of all, key stakeholders. So internally, right, your employees, and then you know, externally customers, uh, suppliers, etc. You know, and just be able to appropriately share good and bad news. Uh, then take a stance of owning the narrative, right? If people are make, you know, in the absence of information, right, people will make up a story. So again, you've got to control that narrative and get out ahead of it. Uh, and then I think the last thing I'd say on this is really just always have that open and honest culture. Uh, because say, if you're looking for ideas, say on how to you know, cut costs or make processes more efficient or things like that, you know, let the best idea win, right? Um, you know, you as the owner or a key leader in the business, you all aren't on the front line. So you may not have all of the best ideas. So have that open and honest culture where all the, the best ideas and even hard questions bubble up to the top. Yeah, this can seem so important and probably often overlooked. I think of this scenario where you might do this middle case that maybe is a let's shift to a different maybe core business process and not focus as much on other ones for employees to understand that. And hey, this is a shift. Here's what it means for everyone in the company to be able to shift that communication is so important. Or you have a small group of the company go one direction. Everyone else says, I don't think that really applies to me. And you've just lost so much time and efficiency. And the thought is you probably are going to keep shifting throughout a downturn because the world and the facts and circumstances are going to keep shifting on you. And I'd say on the other side of this too is during a recession or during tough times is not the best time to start opening the books, right? Like there's a, mm -hmm. I read an article once about like owner's compensation and, you know, they did a, they did a test where they said, all the employees, how much do you think the owners make? And they did it across multiple companies. And it was always like 40 to 50% higher than what the owners actually make, you know? Oh. And so I think the interesting thing is, is that if you just decide to open your books and say, look, now we're not doing well. Now we need your help. Now we need you guys mm -hmm. to make sacrifices. They're gonna be like, okay, after you've made millions and millions of dollars on us, we're the one making sacrifices where if you kind of always have that open book um, philosophy, the company always knows, okay, this month we made 15%. That only means we made a million dollars and 400,000 of that went to taxes. And so, um, and then 200,000 of that went back into investing into the business. So this, this company hasn't been like, just like raking it in for the our entire time I've been working here. So it's important yeah. to have that always there. So that way the company knows, okay, this is, this is a time we really do need to step up as a team and they're not just doing it for you as an owner. I think it's a really good point, Jamie. And even if it was non-financial metrics, right? If the first time you publish it is maybe during a downturn, it may be the same thing. Employees thought we were doing so much better and you show metrics that are actually pretty good and people are really scared. Maybe it's something like our close percent, right? Maybe you have a close percent in your sales process of say 40%, which for many companies is good. If your employees have no idea and you say, hey, right now we're at 40, you may get a reaction like, oh my God, we're in trouble. 60% of the right. people say no to us. You'd rather them understand kind of what is a good measure. And then as you start showing something different, people have that context. Okay, so if we continue on, I'll go ahead and take this one. So now a specific focus on a part of your business. So if you look at your customers, to really look at what is the customer experience and especially focusing on those top customers. So if you happen to have a few top customers that maybe aren't as happy as you think they should be, now is a great time to really get as sticky as you can with those customers and say, how do I try to improve that? So if things get hard, I am not as, I'm not the one that they're looking and saying, let's consolidate if I'm a vendor to someone else to do that. Um, the second somewhat related to that is what is the risk and impact of reductions? One of the measures we talk about with our clients is we talk about customer concentration. So any individual customer that is more than 10% of your business, we think is risky. Now we wouldn't say get rid of that customer, but it is make sure you're seeking other customers to come up with them. So if you looked at your top customers and say, on one hand, do I have some senses in previous downturns how that customer did? And if I can look back and say, wow, they asked for huge discounts, they cut their business, they did all these things, maybe I have an idea in my scenario planning, what that could look like. But you may also look in that middle or lower scenario and say, if these biggest customers had this impact, what does it do to my business? How much might my revenue drop and other things? And then preparing for conversations about discounts. It's not surprising during recessions that customers can come forward and say, hey, we're having a tough time. Can you cut my cost? 
20%, 30%, 50%, something else to think of that ahead of time and understand kind of how you're going to make that decision very much the way Jamie talked about scenario planning. And you may say, if we're in a time where we've got a bench of resources and we're trying to write it out, I may give someone a pretty good size discount and say, yes, for a few months I can because I want my people to be busy. One thing that's really important during that time, though, is to make sure if you're going to give discounts, you talk about because we're in a downturn and during this time period, I'll do it. Otherwise, let's say you give a 30% discount. When rates go back up, you can have a customer freaking out saying, how are you raising my prices? 30%, this is ridiculous. Inflation's not that big. It's almost like they forget that they ever paid that full price. So that kind of understanding up front of, we can do this for this time period. We'll look at it and then we'll revisit it, but your prices are going back up. So that's well understood. Jamie or Tom, any other specific thoughts around customers? Yeah, I just have one quick one, I guess. Uh, so I think just the whole exercise of really understanding, right, the maybe both the, you know, the kind of how the customers rank profitability wise, but also maybe mm -hmm. their impact on your team. Um, so I have a number mm -hmm. of clients that are really trying to understand both, yeah, the, like rank on profitability, but also these are really painful for their team, certain clients for the team to work with. So, so if you did have to go through some sort of downsizing, right, you had less capacity. I think just understanding, yeah, what clients that this actually could be a good opportunity for you to part ways with it, and, and then just focus on increasing profitability with the rest, uh, I think is a good approach. Yep. Yeah, I was going to say, it's just like cleaning house. You know, I know um, my mother and father-in-law recently moved out of a large house into a smaller house because they have, have less kids and they had that, they just had that one room in the house that no one ever went into. It had old furniture and no one really liked it and it was kind of ugly. So that was the time for them to just get rid of that furniture. It's like, okay, do we really need that room? Do we really need that client? And so if you're going to be, go from a $7 million company to a $5 million company, it's kind of the time to think about that. Do we have that room that just has the ugly furniture that we don't want? And so if that client comes to you and says, hey, we need a 20% discount perfect excuse but like yeah, actually we can't do that it's time to cut bait and then you get rid of that client that no one wants to work on and you don't have good profitability anyways and now you're a five million dollar company but you're a lot happier as a five million dollar company so it's a really good time yeah. to to make that decision and we focused a lot on the shrinking customers this is where there's an opportunity also and tom talked about companies who have grown so if you have customers where you feel like you could have more business this could be a great opportunity where you might say have you considered having fewer vendors, we can give you a better price. Maybe our business can grow. And if you're providing a good experience at a good price and you're doing a good job for customers, this may be a great chance where they're actually growing their business with you. And this recession or downturn gives you an opportunity there versus focusing on the risk and what might happen if they walk away. Okay. So if we shift away from customers then, and then if we talk about vendors, basically it's sort of flipping on the other side, are there savings opportunities with these vendors? So if you have vendors where you feel like you could do things at a better price. Maybe you've got certain services that you're paying for from a vendor and in good times, you don't focus on it that closely. Um, I think of with many of our clients where we review things like software subscriptions, dues, things like that where people might sign up for an ongoing service and just don't look that closely whether they're getting the value out of those. Getting those things cut now and doing that can be a really smart thing. Ahead of time where you're not in a scramble where you don't wanna cut things that are you know, really gonna be painful, but just having those opportunities. Maybe discussions of the payments. We talked about discounts. Are there opportunities to get lower prices from your vendors? And then maybe payment terms. Um, you might be in a position where you want to pay people more slowly, or you might have people giving discounts if you'll pay them on time. So just really understanding kind of where you are and what flexibility you have with certain vendors. Okay. And then if you go on and you look specifically at your revenue, and I'm thinking both sales and revenue. So one is really streamlining that sales cycle. So if you look at your sales cycle and the number of days it takes, or maybe the steps, and you don't think that's an efficient process, now is a great time to get that fixed. So to really look and say, hey, when the sales opportunities come through, we need this to be the easiest possible process for people to say yes to us. Similar to what Tom said, and improve your processes, this is one of the ones that's really important to look at. And then really monitoring closely both existing commitments. So if you're looking at those top customers, if we know if a customer is unhappy or something's not going well with their commitment, we're monitoring that really closely. And then also sales leads. All the follow-ups that need to be happening are happening and we're closing the way that we need to. And then looking at discounts. Like I said, now is a time during a downturn is a very frequent time for people to ask for discounts. So really understanding What's the profitability going to be? What does your forecast say? If people ask for discounts, how do you respond to that kind of thing? And just know where your limits are so that can be an efficient process.
this is this is one of the biggest mistakes that I saw during the last um, you know recession was that you get locked into these long term contracts because it's a recession and you feel desperate and you're like okay we just we just have to sign this deal that's twenty percent mm-hmm. less than we usually would but we're going to sign it just because we need we need a customer and then you end up in a great market in a great economy and you still have that deal you're having to go back to a customer that kind of bailed you out of a tough time be like oh by the way I'm gonna need to increase your prices and then they're they're not yeah. happy about it so we saw that a lot and so it's really don't don't make this decision lightly. Like, don't feel desperate. And we'll talk about this a little bit later of how you're not to feel desperate. But like, you know, if you feel desperate, you're just going to be in a really bad situation where you might find one of those really long-term agreements that is not good for your business. And it really hurts you well, well past the actual recession ending. Yeah. And we've stumbled on those, Jamie. I think both you and I, when you forecast with clients and they, they might say, what if I raise my rate? Say I charge $175 an hour. If I may raise my rates to 185, what happens? And we can model that. But then you say, okay, but maybe half of your agreements are locked in at a certain rate through the next year and a half because of that deal you signed. That means if you're going to really try to achieve that, you're doubling ever or you're doubling that increase to everybody else to try to get that average and you're limited to your point. Locking yourself in can be really painful to do. Okay, so if we move on to expenses. Yep, expenses. So the, the key with expenses to me is understanding your expenses first and getting the right people in the room who understand those expenses. It's it's really easy for um, two owners to sit in a room, pull up QuickBooks, run the expense account and just see all the people they're paying money to and be like, we don't need to pay money to this person. We don't need to pay money to this person. Let's just stop it. So it's important to have those conversations with the people in the room that are using those costs and make sure that um, they can still do their job without those expenses. And so you want to go through line by line, understand all your vendors, understand how much you're spending to with them and, and basically get the people involved that are using those and say, is there another tool that we can use is cheaper? Is there a way we can just stop this all together? If we were to bring someone in at a lesser cost, would that make this expense less? And so it's really understanding your expenses, expenses and then scrutinizing them. The next thing is the inefficiencies with focus on variable costs. You know, as you get smaller, what costs are going to go down? If you're running less revenue, what is the big thing that you're spending a ton of money on that's fixed that isn't going to go away? And where are the variable places you can you can sp- you can actually say, okay, as we get smaller, this cost is going to go down because we're going to drop. You know, the big thing is like subscriptions. You know, if you have a an organization, let's just use Harvest for time tracking. If you have and you're paying it in tiers and you have 100 people in there and you have to cut 20% of those people and you're down to 80, does that drop your harvest tier? And make sure you're thinking through that with all those subscriptions and thinking, okay, if we have less people in there, can I renegotiate the amount I'm paying with all those variable cost um, areas? And then the other thing is just communicate. A lot of times you're in a long-term deal that you can't get out of. Um, So you want to make sure you're communicating and thinking through it and thinking, okay, how can I talk to those people with enough time to make those changes? Just like your customers are coming to you and asking for cuts, you want to make sure if you're asking for cuts that you do it within reason and that it's not the first month of a 14-month contract. Now you're asking for a deal. You know, it's, it's making sure you understand the timing of when those changes need to happen and how they can happen. Mm Mm-hmm. And then you stress communication, right, Jamie? If you're going to try yeah. to make changes, uh, to Tom's point about communicating well, that you're cha- doing those things quickly so that you're getting spending under control and people understand what you're talking about. Yeah, and, and it's communicating those internally. So if you're talking to a, a sales team and you say, okay, we're going to go from HubSpot, which is like the Cadillac of sales tools, and now we're going to go to this Excel spreadsheet that I created in my backyard um, one day when I was uh, <laughs> by sitting by the pool, like they're going to have a big, big change in the way they do business. And so it's making sure you talk to that sales team and be like, all right, no longer HubSpot. This is the Excel spreadsheet we're going to use. And this is how you're going to use it. So it's making sure that everybody understands the change and how it affects the business. Yeah. Yeah. One other thing I've seen too, with the whole, like, you know, going through and looking at all your expenses is, you know, is categorize them in, in one of three categories. So one is, you know, critical to function, uh, right. Cause those are almost impossible uh, to, to cut, uh, then it's basically uh, not critical, but important. And then that third category um, is not critical, but nice to have. And that's probably, you know, the first place you want to start cutting and probably even preemptively, you know, trimming some of the fat on, on the expenses. Yeah. And I think it's important understanding which expenses fall into those three categories. And it's, it's sometimes it's a personal opinion, you know, like one of the clients that I was working with feeding their team every day for a lot of people, that was in the third category. Okay, this isn't really necessary to them. That was like, okay, this is really important. This keeps our people happy. This is part of our culture. This is who we are. And so it's it's having that conversation ahead of time instead of having it when you are really desperate for making cuts. It's like having everybody understand what are those really critical expenses. Yeah. 
Last but not least, um, I think we originally, when we were planning this, is like, should we do the David Letterman countdown? And I think that's why this one ended last because it is really important. And maybe it's just <laughs> yeah. me as an accountant think it's that important. But um, I, I feel like having cash in the bank and having as much cash as you can going into a recession, it just changes the whole game. You know, I, I during the um, last recession, I had a company that was really good with cash. They had, you know, well above their cash reserves. They had money that they were waiting to invest. They were just waiting for the right time to invest it. And then we went into this recession and a lot of companies weren't planning and they were they were just like, we, we don't know what to do. And so they were able to go through and talk to those companies and actually purchase one company that has helped grow their company because they actually had cash in the bank. And this company was just struggling. They had a great reputation. They had great people and they were able to jump in and use that cash for that investment because they, they, went, into the, they went into a recession with cash in the bank. And so if you have cash in the bank, you're going to be able to take advantage of a lot of the discounts that are out there. You're going to be able to take advantage of a lot of the problems that others are seeing during the recession because you've saved up. So this, this to me, is the best one you can do is if you have cash in the bank going into recession it just allows you to make decisions that others aren't making which puts you ahead of the game yep. so a couple things there um, we, we talk all the time about cash reserve um, you know if you have cash reserve know what your cash reserve needs to be know what how much money you have above that cash reserve because the cash reserve if you say we want to have 20 percent of revenue as our cash reserve you always want to have 20 percent of cash as a cash reserve and so that that's the amount that you want to keep there once you start getting over that that's money that you can invest. And I'm not talking about always investing in stocks. When people hear investments, they always hear, okay, I'm going to go to the stock market and buy a mutual fund. You can also invest in your company. You can invest in other companies. You can invest in a lot of things. So if your cash reserve is 20% of revenue and you have 40% of revenue, that means you have double the cash that you can make decisions with. And so it's making sure you mm -hmm. understand how much that you always need to keep in that reserve and how much cash do you have liquid. Because sometimes what that investment is, is I think this recession is only going to last three months. So I'm willing to have break-even months or maybe even loss months and keep my team together and invest in that and just take losses and use my cash reserve a little bit as long as you don't go below that 20% that you've set up. Line of credit, um, everybody's heard this, but I'll, I'll repeat it just in case you haven't, but um, it's easier to get a line of credit when things are going well than when they're not going well. So if you're trying to get a line of credit when you're in a really bad place, good luck. You know, if you're going to talk to the bank and they're going to look at your financials yeah. and they're going to say, oh yeah, we can give you... $20,000 of line of credit, but that's it. Where if you go to them in a really good time when things are going really well and you can say, oh, yeah, look at us and they'll give you that $2 million line of credit and then you have enough money to, to drop into if you really get to emergencies. And so um, we usually recommend a line of credit similar to that cash reserve. So if your goal is to have a 20% revenue as your cash reserve, then you should try to have a line of credit that's similar to that amount. And uh, again, it's a lot easier to do that when you're, when you're doing really well versus when you really need it. And Jamie, just to clarify, or just to help people understand, well, when you say revenue, we're talking about 12 months worth of revenue. So if you're a $2 million company, that 20% would be $400,000. And we recommend a range from 10% up to 30%, depending on risk. If you're really thinking downturn, you want that number higher. But the 10% tends to equate to two to three months worth of expenses. Um, it comes very close to that for most companies, and it's a very easy number to keep track of versus the constant, can you add up all my expenses and tell me what that's going to be? Um, so yes, and I, I've had cases where my clients have had a really good cash reserve and the line of credit conversation with the bank is so easy to have that you're like, we've got a half million dollars sitting in the bank and we want a half million dollar line of credit. And you're even telling the client, I'm hoping we never even touch this and you're paying a couple thousand dollars a year to maintain that line of credit, but you've got that peace of mind of how long you can continue running the business if you have to tap into it. Yeah, that's uh, and I agree that this is cash is number one. Uh, Vern Harnish has this great quote. He says that you can get by with decent people, strategy, and execution, but not a single day without cash. So, mm. <laughs> great point. Yeah. Yeah. So then just two other tips here. The first is to actively manage receivables. Um, in one of the presentations we do, we have a chart. It, it, the first time we created it, Jody and I just kept looking back at it like, this can't be right. There's no way that uh, managing your receivables makes that big of a difference on cash. And it, we, we test the math. We did it three or four different times. And it is crazy the amount of difference it makes on your balance sheet to have, to have your money in cash versus to have it in receivables. So mm -hmm. what we're talking about here is if you 
if your AR turns every 45 days, then you're going to have, you know, those big dips as the AR moves slowly. If you're able to turn that down to 15 days, then more of your cash or more of your short-term assets are sitting in cash versus AR. So if you can turn it every 15 days, then you're just going to always have a higher cash balance because the invoice goes out and you're collecting it within 15 days. So it's really important to do everything you can to try to get those receivables as fast as possible. And that, a lot of that's negotiations, you know, negotiations for taking discounts. Um, if you're going to take a one percent discount on a um, 10 day turn it's probably worth it you know if you can get that collections within 10 days it's worth taking the one percent hit on it um and the other thing is is a lot of companies don't think of that as part of the negotiations when you're talking to a um to someone you're like okay we want to we want, we want this deal to be 10 million I'm like nope we're only willing to pay you 9 million okay we'll take 9 million but will you pay us in 15 days? Sure, we can change the payment mm -hmm. terms. Like it's negotiating that up front. People don't always think of that as negotiation terms and it makes a huge difference when it comes to your, your cash. Yep. And then last is just seek uh, and leverage growth opportunities. You know, I talked about this earlier, but if you have cash, it gives you the opportunity to grow during a um, during a recession. And so, you know, I've always, it's always fun to watch when this advice comes true and someone's like, wow, Six months ago, we would have had to buy that company and it would have cost us $2 million. Now that we're in a recession, we just bought that company for 500000 Having cash and being able to do that just made all the difference for us. And so it's, it's fun to see that come true. And so again, if you have cash in the bank, it just makes a recession so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. It's an excellent point. Okay. So there's our top 10 list. We got through all 10, all these things to do. <laughs> yeah. So now, now that you know what you do, so that... The first thing is, it's you know, what can we do to help? Um, so I, obviously you have uh, two people here that have, or two groups, two organizations here that have been through um, a lot of these with a lot of companies. And so obviously you know where to find us, but I would say the biggest thing, I know we have a, a mixed audience here. We have some CPAs in here who are helping their clients. And I would say it starts with the forecast. It starts with knowing how to build a forecast and knowing how to build scenario planning within that forecast. I think that's the number one thing that, we as CPAs can do. Um, so if you're a business owner, I guess the way we can help is make sure you have someone in, in, in your organization that can help you forecast and help you run through those scenarios. So that's, um, that's the first thing there to kind of conclude the top 10 list is A, if you're a CPA, make sure you're really good at forecasting. B, if you're a business owner, make sure you have someone in your organization that's really good at forecasting and can help you make those quick decisions we've talked about throughout these top 10. Yeah, the only thing I would add before Tom helps us talk through the next steps is doing this well in advance. Um, if if you have a if you don't have a conversation with these clients and you've got a client who's really in trouble and say four months into the downturn and customers have left, they're out of cash, they have too many employees and say they're really inefficient processes, you don't have a lot of levers as an advisor to tell them what things they can do, as opposed to upfront seeing those things and saying, let's get those things fixed before you come into a downturn, they're going to help you if you don't have a downturn, and they're going to help you in it. So you put yourself in a better position. Tom, what what next steps would you suggest that people take if they're okay, you, you've got me bought in, we've got the pull yeah. up. Most people are saying that they think yes, we'll probably have a recession. We had 68% either I think we're in one now, or I think we'll have one in 2023. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you advance the slide, Tom, so basically, mm -hmm. um, so so obviously, well, again, you know what our theme is here today, prepare prepare, prepare, right? Yes. So um, uh, when you get these uh, files tomorrow, one of the files you're going to get is just, again, a simple um, SWOT analysis. So really, if you if you didn't do it today during the webinar, go back and think about, again, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and especially with those 10 strategies uh, that, that we walked through today, right? And use those as kind of uh, conversation starters in your mind and actually ideally do this with some other key leaders in your business. So kind of complete that downturn it in a swap first, that'd be one. Then number two is basically, all right, you can't do everything. Uh, so what uh, we'd recommend is just pick top three areas to focus on. So is it going to the bank and increasing your line of credit? Is it going to a vendor, you know, changing terms, et cetera? Is it, you know, ranking all of your employees, right? What, whatever that might be, kind of hone in on, you know, what, what that area of focus is. And, and then in terms of the kind of work I do, uh, I, you know, I call those rocks, right? Your few most important priorities over the next, you know, one to three months. Uh, and, and that'll also be in what you get tomorrow is just a simple rock planner, just to kind of help you flesh out all of the steps and what are your objectives in terms of turning these ideas here that you got today and whichever are most important for you into actual tangible action. 
so those are next steps. Uh, and then Tom, if you keep going here, so that's, yeah, that's, you're going to get that in your, your email tomorrow. And then uh, the other thing is just reach out to us, right? So, uh, you know, the kinds of things I spoke on today, uh, helping, you know, but vision, strategy, planning, better meetings, better team health and culture, those are the kinds of things. And these are the kinds of books and systems that I work out of. Be happy to talk to anybody if you'd like an assessment or a debrief on any of these uh, kinds of tools. So feel free to reach out uh, to me on that. Oh, can you go back one slide real quick? Yeah. I think the biggest thing there, and I've worked with Tom several times on both my clients and at Summit, is is painting done. You know, I think that's something that people often forget. It's like, okay, we came up with this huge rock, we came up with this plan that that's super important to our company, but how do we know when we complete it? And it seems like a simple question, but it's a lot harder than you think. And I'm sure Tom can expand on that a little bit. But like painting, what actually? How do we know that this is implemented? How do we know yeah. that we have enough cash? Like, what does done look like? Yeah, and actually, well, the cash one would be a great example, right? So say in all of this, if one of the things you feel like, again, you need to go do is say, increase your line of credit with the bank. Well, okay, that's your direction. But like, well, do we need to increase it 100,000 or a million? And that's where you probably have to work through kind of uh, all the details of you know what, what's the right number we need to ask uh, the bank. And that, that's part of painting down, like what exact number and then by when as well uh, do we need to get that done? Yeah, and that's a good example, right? The line of credit available is most likely done as opposed to you giving it to someone and Jamie saying, well, I contacted the bank and I gave them some of the stuff and we're waiting. Well, that's, that's not done. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I'm sure you reinforced Tom that I really like about this process, we gave a lot of things that probably felt overwhelming. I can't do all those things at once. The idea of focusing on a few things and once those are finished, moving on in the next is so powerful versus saying, we're going to do all of them. We're going to do employees and customers and scenario planning and everything. And most companies, what you would find is that's just too much and you don't make progress on any of the individuals. Yeah, completely agree. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of resources for things you have, both Summit CPA um, for that, and then also navigate the journey in here. So I hope from the intro, we go walk people through and said what the objectives were. I hope people feel like the action pieces are out there. And if it's a case where you haven't done forecasting and you're a CPA doing that, you can reach out to us and we can help with that. I would find, I would guess most people will find that they're, if you're CPAs, you're probably better at it than what you think you are and having that conversation with clients ahead of time. Tom, for people who want to reach out to you, business owners and others, uh, I would assume that you would help them go through SWOT analysis, rocks, and all these different steps. Uh, yeah, completely. Uh, yeah. So again, any, anything I talked about today, more than happy. Uh, if you reach out to me, more than happy to talk to you about, you know, um, you know, further details. Actually, there is one chat. Uh, Mary asked, what does FAST stand for? Mm. So it's basically, um, well, usually with ROCKS, it's SMART, right? That's the acronym that has been kind of the most important. But FAST actually is uh, frequently discussed, ambitious, specific, and transparent. Mm. So that, that's what the acronym stands for. Good. And we came with one more question that we got from an anonymous person asked if we would go over vendors one more time. And so to quickly summarize this, we looked and said, are there vendors where you are not leveraging them that you could reduce and not use them? And my example was dues and subscriptions and things like software. Are there vendors where you could be seeking discounts from those vendors? And then are there payment terms that you think that you could get better payment terms or just make sure that payment terms are well established to both give you flexibility and maybe have discounts? A good example for this at Summit was, you know, a vendor that we work with is a um, administrative assistant type vendor. And so they give us a certain number of hours each month. And it's something that we went back and looked is I think they gave us like 120 hours a month. And we were looking at how many we were actually using. We were only using 20. So we're paying for 120. We were only using 20. So we made it a goal to increase the number of hours we were using with that administrative assistant, which right, we're already paying for them. Might as well use them and, and really go through those and, um, and, and figure out who can use an administrative assistant help. What can we do? Can we work with them on our client email answering? And so we went through and just really identified that and were able to use more hours than we already than were already contracted for. So that was one way to do it. The other yeah. way would have been to be like, hey, we're only using 20. Is there a way we can renegotiate with you? So there's kind of two ways to look at those, those vendors, but that's just a good example of something we've done real time here at Summit. Yeah. Um, we are getting a couple more questions, Tom. Someone said, what was S again? Uh, specific. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Right. And let's do the last one. Can you clarify what right people versus an A player? Uh, yeah. Um, 
So uh, there's a lot of talk out there about, well, Jim Collins said, right, you get to get right people on the bus and the right seats. And I think yep. sometimes, and especially over the last few years, I think when, when hiring being so hard, it's just like any warm body is kind of like a right person. And we sort of have just these two categories of like, either you're a right person or you're not. Uh, but I think, I think um, it's like anything, right? The categories we come up with really impact, right? Our understanding and in action. So, so I feel like a better way to do is actually really more like an ABC approach, right? Who, who are your top tier employees? And so that would be somebody who, who highly fits your culture and is highly productive both. Uh, and so kind of a, uh, use a categorization, maybe more like ABC as opposed to just simply saying, yeah, they're a the right person. And that, that's, that's what I mm -hmm. found uh, to be more helpful. Good, excellent. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and end it there. Uh, Jamie and Tom, thank you again. I think this was really helpful and I hope that people got a lot out of today's session. Mm -hmm.